<laughs> Check it out, James. Hey everyone, I'm James Huang, Global Tech Editor for CyclingTips.com, Pink Bike's sister publication. And we are here in Sedona, Arizona for the 2020 Pink Bike Value Bike Field Trip. We're looking at four bikes here in the budget bike category under $2,000 US. The Kona Hanzo, the Caliber Boss Nut, the Vetus Mythique VRX, and the Giant Stance One. We're here with Mike Levy and Mike Kazmer. Guys, what do you think of these bikes? What you can get for under $2,000, it is pretty impressive these days. I mean, I remember when $2,000 is hard to get a, even a full suspension bike that would work basically. But now there's definitely some contenders. So, I mean, big question. You guys are used to testing bikes that are way more expensive than this price point. What are you losing when you drop down to 2,000 bucks? I mean, I think one thing you're gonna lose is, well, you're gonna gain actually, you're gonna gain some weight. They are gonna be a bit heavier. I don't think weight matters all that much, uh, but these bikes end up being a two to four pounds heavier than what you would get if you spent double the money. So that's, that's a thing all across the board in this category, we're talking about aluminum frames. Um, so those tend to be one to two pounds heavier than your normal carbon frame. You also lose some refinements as far as adjustability goes, your fork, uh, your brakes, they're not quite as adjustable as you'd get if you spent more money. A big thing on the trail too, on the performance front is this front suspension, like pretty much all these bikes, the rear suspension, well, except for the hardtails, the rear suspension on those wasn't so good. <laughs> but the rear suspension on these other bikes, like it works just fine. But at the front of the bike, it's a different story. Once you're down into $2,000, you're dealing with some lower end front suspension. And you could definitely feel a difference in control when you're riding hard over rough terrain. Like the damping isn't as good. The air springs aren't as progressive. There's a difference at the front for sure. Right, because I guess at the, in the back end, you can get away with a lot just by getting all the pivot placements and everything right. But up front, there's no hiding whether, when you got cheaper internals on yeah. the fork. You're dealing with leverage and stuff at the back that hides a lot of things. At the front, it's one to one. Um, it's your first point of impact too. That's what you're noticing. Yeah. It's kind of easier to turn your brain off what the back of the bike's doing in the front, you notice it. Yeah, so what was your favorite of the four? I think for me, that would be the V. This would be my top pick out of these four bikes. And the parts are really what does. The geometry was, was great. It kind of fit in right in line with all the other bikes in this category. But it had that Z2 fork up front, which I'd say is definitely a standout. Just felt like a lot higher end fork. Um, simple to adjust, easy to get set up. Then out on the trail, really nice performance. And then the bike itself felt like a great, good all around trail bike. Yeah, I'd agree with Casimir. The Vetus was probably my favorite bike out of those four. It, for me, it feels like a classic trail bike, great suspension, front and rear. Um, when you think like the Boss Nut is, it works out to around $1,400. So the Vetus is $600 more. Casimir, we rode both those bikes. That Vetus, it rides, it, that's worth $600 more. Yeah, you get that nicer fork. You also have good tires on it. A lot of these bikes came with kind of a cheaper dual compound, just really entry level tires, if there's such a thing. But this one has a good Schwabby rubber on there, soft rubber, so pretty good for going on the slippery rocks around here. Shimano brakes, but they're a couple steps above the bottom of the barrel, which is nice. They do perform much better than, um, say, the Giant Stance or even the Kona Hanzo. The brakes on those aren't that impressive. So in general, though, at this price point, when you're spending a few hundred bucks, you're getting a much bigger difference down here than if you're spending a few hundred bucks at like, you know, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Yeah, I'd say the difference between a, you know, sixty, six hundred dollar bike versus a seven thousand dollar bike, it's going to be negligible. But at this price point, it does make a difference. So what was your least favorite bike of the, of the bunch? Definitely the Giant Stance. It all starts with the frame and it doesn't matter what you hang off of it if the frame isn't as good. And that giant frame, it just feels dated. The geometry isn't there. It has a quick release rear end between the geometry and, you know, it just felt flexy and everything and the, the brakes. Yeah, I think that one I was, I was almost disappointed because I had higher expectations for it. I wanted it to do well, just I mean, because that price point is great. Like 1800 bucks with a dropper post on paper, you're like, that could be a great bike. Someone just getting in the sport, doesn't want a hardtail to start off with. That could be good. And Giant's such a massive company. They have all the resources necessary to tweak that geometry a bit, give it a good through axle. And it could be there, but right now it's just not. Um, in terms of geometry, I mean, is that the sort of thing where, you know, yeah, I mean, when you spend more money, you get more stuff. But geometry is something that you kind of, in theory, get for free, right? So is there any yeah. reason in this day and age why someone shouldn't be able to get it right? Definitely not. Like, you look at that, the Caliber Boss Nut, like, besides having an amazing name, the Boss Nut's geometry, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like a thousand British pounds, 1400 ish dollars or so. I mean, the geometry is like, it could be a little longer, whatever. Yeah, but, but it's fine. It's pretty close, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we are at a nice point now where uh, we've seen geometry change 
fairly dramatically over the last five years, I'd say. But right now, all that geometry is pretty much trickled down into these budget bikes as well. So you don't have to buy an expensive bike to get the latest and greatest geometry, uh, which makes a good, you know, good difference out on the trail. Were there any surprises in this test? For me personally, I thought the Hanzo, that was kind of my second favorite bike. And that's a, you know, $1,500 hardtail with some lower end components on it, but I had a good time on it. Just kind of reminded me of a overgrown dirt jumper. So with a few upgrades on there, it could be great, just kind of all around classic hardtail. So was there one that you guys would pick that you would maybe buy with the mindset that, you know, this is all the money you have right now, but this is a bike I can grow into if you, if you spend some more money on some upgrades? Definitely the Venus for me. Mm -hmm. um, that would make the most sense. Like it, like I said before, it's $600 more than the Boss Nut, but it's, it's more capable than that $600 would lead you to believe, I think. You know, that's a bike that could grow with you for a long time. And it could potentially save you money down the road if stuff isn't breaking as much and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, the Boss Nut's $1,400. So the Vita's $600 more. How much is that Z2? And the other stuff on there is, you, it's gonna cost you more money to put those things on that Boss Nut. So if you can do it, just spend the money right out of the gate. Yeah, but I'll th I'd say three out of the four of these bikes are worthy bikes of starting with and upgrading components as you go, uh, whether it's the Hanzo, the Vetus or the Boss Nut, all of them have potential that you can just kind of, as time goes on, you wear stuff out, put better parts on there, and you'll still have a great bike. Speaking of parts, I mean, two of these bikes are direct to consumer, and two of them are traditional brick and mortar business model. Um, I mean, there's an obvious value difference between the two, but direct to consumer on paper makes a lot of sense, but I mean, is there a case where that might not be the best choice for people? I mean, would someone prefer one or the other? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can save a lot of money by going direct to consumer. Uh, we have noticed that. The price difference isn't quite as great as it first was when these direct -to consumer brands came out. I think they underpriced some of the product just to say, hey, we're here, look at our stuff. And now that price is kind of, it's still cheaper to go direct to consumer. There's no denying that. But I'd say the bigger brands have noticed and kind of maybe adjusted prices there. Uh, but you do, if you go direct to consumer, you're losing out on the ability to have that shop experience right away. Some people, it's fine, no, no big deal. Bike comes in a box, they build it up, they never need to go to their local shop. But some people that maybe just get into the sport or just want someone to kind of talk to one-on-one -on -one in real life, they like that shop experience. What about warranty support? Yeah, that's another thing. It is nice to be able to go into your local shop and talk to the guy behind the counter. Hopefully he's nice or she's nice and they can help you with that warranty right there. Uh, it can take a little longer with direct to consumer. So at this price point, you maybe get, you know, lesser front suspension, except in the case of that Morzoki fork. Uh, you know, some of the components are downgraded compared to some other stuff, but are there any like deal breakers or things that you really don't want to skimp on regardless of how much you're spending? Uh, I think one of the big things is dropper posts. Like you obviously want a bike with the dropper posts if you can get it. Um, and at a certain price point, they don't come with dropper posts. I mean, they cost more money, you know, it's 200 bucks or whatever. Um, and then the other notable thing is the shifters. It's a small thing, but like the value drivetrains with the NX and the SX shifters, mm -hmm. you can't uh, mount them on the brake clamp with the matchmaker mm -hmm. thing. So it means that they, they usually have to sit inboard and they're they're actually fairly hard to reach. Like those paddles should be longer. They should have, if you can't mount it on the brake lever, the paddle should be longer. It should be a little different. Small thing, but eh, it's worth noting. Or you need a bigger thumb. Bigger hands. My hands are still growing. They'll get bigger. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I hear that's what happens. Yeah, that's <laughs> totally what happens. <laughs> All right, those are our thoughts on the value bike category at the 2020 Pink Bike Field Trip here in Sedona, Arizona. If you want to hear more, make sure you hit subscribe down below. And if you have any curiosity about gravel bikes, make sure you check out Cycling Tips too, because we are here testing a bunch of gravel bikes and we might have some surprises there as well. Thanks a lot.